Hello and welcome to the 41st episode of the Mike McNair Revolutionary Strategy Series. Today is Thursday the 2nd of April 2020 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. I'm back after a couple weeks out with a suspected dose of the Illuminati depopulation virus. There is some new research straight out of Japan saying that there is a podcast infection vector to the disease so make sure to stay at least two meters away from your speakers while listening. This week we finish our reading of Paul Cockshot's critique of the book and gather our thoughts. I have the new patron ZXYWVUT and returning patron Ryan Tardiff to thank. I've fallen behind in my output due to the illness but I've been putting this time to some very good use doing a lot of hardcore research and reading for future interviews I'm planning. Unfortunately, I've also had to reschedule a wrap-up interview with Mike McNair due to technical difficulties, so stay tuned for that. We may even need to reconvene the panel to respond to Mike at a future date. But barring that, this here episode is the end of the line. I have, a, I have a question for us all, right? You can't read Capital and not know Marx was a classicist. Yes, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah. Like Aristotle's in those footnotes all over the place. All over the yeah. place. Yeah, he'll just no, drop he Greek about, into the main text. <laughs> yeah, he talks about Aristotle, how he, the reason why he couldn't deduce value properly, social necessary time because it was a slave society, blah, blah, blah. He talks about it all over the place, right? But, for example, does Marx ever talk about Republic versus... Athenian democracy. No, surely he's got to be talking about it somewhere. I, no, well, so. I mean, that's what, that's what I was actually the, the weirdness of like the Brumaire in particular is where this comes up because that's where the you know the need for the dictatorship of a class comes up. Well, that's that's Republican, but he's also he talks more and more like a Athenian Democrat as he goes on. Like he get he gets less and less faith in rep- representational government. Like that's explicit, but he doesn't ever he doesn't pull it back to the classical roots. It's uh, it's also like how like. Like Marxist materialism is like actually kind of idiosyncratic because it's Hegelian Epicurean, <laughs> um, no, not it's modern, a, and it's like, a, it's a non-utilitarian form of consequentialism. You know, with a, <laughs> explain with that a, gobbledygook. Explain yeah. all that gobbledygook. Well, I mean, like, his materialism is is formal in that, and I mean that it's it's formal. Like he believes in material forms. Like forms are material things, and uh, that that goes back to Epicureanism. And that's what he was writing his his PhD, you know, thesis that he didn't finish and abandoned was a Hegelian reading of Epicureanism. I mean, Marx does come out of like the German idealist tradition explicitly, but like he was a, he wasn't the classicist wing of it. And that informs a lot of his ideas. It also is like why he didn't take non european I mean, p- part of his capital development, part of why he didn't take non-European ideas that seriously till later. Like, you know, he, like it was it wasn't until like way after 1848 where he starts like recanting like you know the progressive nature of imperialism and stuff are, are you trying to say are you trying to say that he's a materialist that believes in the power of ghosts basically like not literal ghosts but you know like yeah cor- yeah I mean, corporate, believes, corporate collective he, entities he believes in collective entities he believes in formations he believes like it's a completely different set of assumptions yeah it's an emergentist paradigm you might say right and, and that comes out of Epicureanism. Like it's a, that's a different materialist okay. tradition than like the the analytic one that most of us have. Yeah, one neuron, one vote. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> They're both atomic, but that's like really it that they share. And there's all these kinds of assumptions running through Marx, but they're just like, they're like, you have to really know your shit to know this. This is why I'm always like a little skeptical of the people like anybody can pick Marx up and get it all. I'm like, no, you can't. <laughs> like you really can't it can be a groovy read and you can like kind of it can, you can reflect on a lot of stuff but i don't know just like reading anything from like a million bajillion years ago there's a lot of context to unpack that's that's all kind of cool and groovy and and potentially creative unless you have someone that's trying to shape it towards some kind of weird philosophical life view that'll take away your agency <laughs> right which, which which by the way this is you know, prime fodder for 
but to bring it back, like, no, Marx doesn't, I don't think Marx, I, I shouldn't say that, that he doesn't, there might be some, whenever I say like Marx doesn't do something, someone's going to find a letter on the back of a napkin somewhere where like he does. <laughs> Please send that to us. I do want to see that napkin. <laughs> um, but as far as I know, he doesn't talk about that distinction very much. Although he knew it for sure. It was like the basic fucking distinction between Athenian and, and uh, you know, Republican Roman. But the, the, the thing is about Republican Roman as, as the Roman model of democracy is interesting, right? Because it's a precursor to Bonapartism in that the more democratic it gets, the more it really does follow the Aristotelian model. Like the more popular support a single individual has, the more likely they are to be a dictator. That's just true in the Roman model. Like, it, like Caesar had popular support. It wasn't just Stalinists who make that, you know, St Stalinist Bonapartists like Michael Parenti who make that argument. It's kind of- a, I, I, I really love that he wrote a book about defending Caesar. I kind of love That's that. Really, he, he, it's really yeah. good. I've seen his, his talk on it. It's <laughs> fucking brilliant. Oh my God. Oh God, I got to read that just, just for bong reps. I highlighted one sentence here where he goes on about the wisdom of crowds. Like- I quote him here, there's wisdom in crowds for the collective will contain people with many different skills and experiences. That's not why the wisdom of crowd works. Like the wisdom of crowds is really good for certain things like, say, estimating the weight of a cow. You know, they're actually really accurate at that. But like that's because people have a concept of weight and volume and they know it. But when you're talking about something where they don't have any experience of, there isn't a wisdom in the crowd. Maybe the average person can get a crash course on something and make the right decision better than professionalized, you know, special yeah. class. Yeah, can. That's, that's true. But the, wis the wisdom of crowds actually does have like when people talk about it, they miss it as blind spot is two things. Either something you're completely unfamiliar with or something you're, you're culturally motivated to not consider. Those mm -hmm. two things, the wisdom of crowds do not play in at all. In fact, it cuts in the opposite direction. And, you know, hopefully everybody gets uh, taught really well. Uh, except, except the engineers. Um, <laughs> we we got to keep them specialists. <laughs> yeah, dumbed well, down know, hopefully in chemical physics. You'll see some fellow over in the corner drooling. You go, oh, who who's that? He goes, that's the chemical physicist. Oh my god! <laughs> you leave you leave my precious sweet Spetsy alone. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Puya. We're all, I'm going every, in on you tonight. Every, in the future, every, everybody will be the guy drooling in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <probably. laughs> I've got a question for the panel. Are we all mm -hmm. sorticianists? Yeah. I actually, I, I kind of am, um, but uh -huh. I, I don't know that. I don't. I actually am not totally sure we get out of some kind of representational government for the reasons of respecting human difference. But I, I'm, I, I am still like, but we should probably just let it be chosen randomly by lot. <laughs> like, but I mean, but I mean, you can. I mean, there's plenty. Of, you, can, you know, you can still advocate for it. Like, you know, you can have can, a party that advocates for, you know, even in the U.S., like most people there pro care about the minority rights. Like, we, I, to, to a degree, I, th I think that's true. I think it, there's deeper questions when maybe it comes to like Native Americans and stuff like that. At that probably maybe sortition isn't going to produce the best results right now, to be honest. Are, are we saying that as communists that we don't have any constitution? <sighs> Good one. Are we still constitutionalists? Do we believe in a, a socialist constitution? I, I, I used to think I did. This, I don't know. This is a deep problem here is that we have, you know, small democratic experiments big kind of bourgeois republics and we have kind of stuff that didn't work very democratically that was called republics like North Korea. And that's the body of stuff that we're working with. This is where Kautskyism, you know, and even, you know, Martov, you know, the Soviet internal opposition that ended up loyal to the Reds. But before the Re October revolution was like, no, 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 we don't need to overthrow constitutional government. What else are we going to fucking do? There's a whole Marxist tradition that's like, oh, no, 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 don't overthrow the Constitution. I mean, yeah, let's get a Constitution, but no, no don't overthrow it. Maybe we can, like, uh, amend it and work with it, you know? Uh, Marx said stuff about this, right? Yeah. No, no, don't overthrow it for, you know, direct democracy, because what if direct democracy doesn't work? Then what will happen? You'll probably get something worse than constitutional government. So however we feel about, like, 
the Kaltskiist tradition that ends up being like, eh, fuck Soviets, fuck direct democracy, fine. We just go to the fucking parliament for the rest of my life. Like, wh however dismal those horizons are, do we have a better answer here? <laughs> like, what what is our response? But like, why is it not possible to combine forms as in constitutional sortition, whereby you can decide on stuff, but you've got constitutional norms. And if, if people object, they can bring it to a constitutional referendum or something like that. Surely it's easy to combine these forms. I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's, it's not. It's just that, you know, I, I, we're, I don't see proposals for this. The degree that I see proposals for it, maybe from like the CPUSA or something. I mean, it, it doesn't look all that great. Like, or, or maybe like, Maybe even if the policies on paper were fine, like, I don't know. It, it doesn't seem to, like, take into account how all this radical bong rip, extreme democracy and, and radical critique, like, how, how do we incorporate that in, into this? Like, participatory well, yeah. economics is, is, like, something that tries to do this with the economy. And everyone makes oh, fun of it because it sounds like hell, right? But, it really um, does. Like, it's like if, if my entire life was fucking faculty meetings, that's what that would be. Like you have to read that stuff with maybe I don't know. Well, think of them. Think of that as like a thought experiment. Like, okay, now that we've reflected on that, like, what do we, what do we don't like about it? And then, okay, fine, that's a dumb proposal. What's a better proposal? Okay, so know. like even Cockshot basically advocates some kind of constitutional form in towards a new socialism, right? He has different deliberative bodies and different branches of government that would be given some kind of constitutional legitimacy. Doesn't get too far into the constitutionalism, but I do not see how his scheme could work without it. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 the thing is, we all kind of need that sort of formal limitation to hold things down. Otherwise, we, we don't have, like, how do you centrally plan without a deliberative body? Yeah, no, I mean, I mean so from what I remember, uh, there Let's is... For Bordiga. Maybe that's what we need to do is just... <laughs> Right. You could just have a computer do it. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> bleep bloop. <laughs> Problem solved. Fixed. Bleep bloop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, my God. <laughs> if only but we had I, some I kind of a... Seriously, though, like, even in given my experiences in, like, small communities, like, having a constitution is a good idea. Agreed. And, like, maybe you have a jury that decides on its application but there should be a constitution correct correct I mean, what what are the alternatives to a constitution i have one i have one no constitution the dictatorship of the proletariat's not a constitutional government though you can make a constitution of it you can just say uh fuck you bourgeoisie you're not getting a vote Everybody else does. The <laughs> start of the Soviet <laughs> constitutions, like, yeah, we killed those bourgeoisie, did we? Well, I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean we're, we're, laughing, we're laughing about this, but uh, again, that, that opposition leader Martov, after the October Revolution, look, he w was in favor of of keeping, you know, the old constitutional government, but especially because you know he's he's Jewish, and you know this is during the Russian Civil War, where the White Army becomes like Tsarist Black Hundreds. So he's like, okay, I'm siding with the Reds. The other fucking uh, Mensheviks who side with the black, the, the blacks, which is uh, the whites, which is crazy. I mean, honestly, you know, it seemed like a great deal more of the Mensheviks. This is a, a vast majority of the Mensheviks were, you know, as where Martov was, and I think it was, you know, driven by his social being as a Jew, and you know, you know, like. He, he, well, also he, a lot of the other Mensheviks liquidated in the Bolsheviks priorly too, like Trotsky. Yeah, yeah, for example. yeah. No, no, I, no. Like a lot of the, yeah, no. For sure. But like he was very serious about constitutional government and, you know, sort of like being against the death penalty, but could not could not stand by what the other Mensheviks were becoming because of it. He ends up entertaining basically like, OK, look, I, I just want some kind of like theory of what would be a good constitutional form. Maybe we, we could like have like a Soviet democracy. And we could even exclude the bourgeoisie. So he comes up with a theoretical sort of class dictatorship of the proletariat that would be like a, a form that would integrate the bourgeois constitutionalism that he wanted, you know, basically from the constituent assembly and elements of the Soviet, of the workers' councils and the Soviets. So th this was like something that people were thinking about and chewing on. I mean, it's not much of a sketch I mean, it's not much more than a sketch there, but like, 
when I get through McNair, it doesn't really lead me to Kautsky. It leads to that moment in Martov to me where someone is like, okay, I see like why that went like it did, but that direct democratic experiment doesn't work by itself. What do you take from this? You know, how do you, with all these lessons, do we have anything positive to say? So you're trying to stop me from becoming Tommy Sulla is what you're saying. Um, could, you, could you unpack that a little bit? <laughs> so, you know, I just like seize control. Like I just like become dictatorship and then like get rid of all my enemies and then all the enemies of the people. And then like, <laughs> and then, like I retire to my farm and like let society restart again after we've eradicated everyone. And then you can figure out if there's a fucking constitution. So you're trying to talk me out of that, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, more or less. I mean, like, you know, like. Well, we haven't talked about Tom. Tom still got his plane ticket, but maybe if you convince me, I don't know. I mean, I, I actually, I actually do like. I like what I like in McNair is the idea of like socialist constitutionalism, and what would that look like? So, uh, what what is an international republic like? How do you balance democracy? But I do actually think sortition does fix some of the problems that I do have with party <clears throat> dominance in McNair. I think that's a real problem, I, and I don't think yeah. it really addresses it. We should read some of the stuff on sortition that's in here. You know what I mean? Like, because, and the, the stuff about Aristotle. I don't know. Do you think that's, do we think that's worth it? Would that just hold us up? Like, well, I think this is going to come up again when we talk about the Brumaire. I don't but know. No, nobody says it clearer than Cockshot, honestly. You know, with all the things slagging him off for being a Stalinist that might be using extreme democracy arguments for duplicitous reasons or something. I actually just haven't found a better. No, I, mean, I actually, I, I'm going to give Kunkshut the benefit of the doubt. I believe that he's a, that he like, that he does seem to think that like, that he's a Stalinist, but like, like, like he actually does seem to like some kind yeah. of democratic apparatus because he thought that's a yeah. problem. He does think that's a problem with Stalinism. He's just like, doesn't want to critique all the yeah. other parts of Stalinism. <laughs> No, 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 yeah, no, I, I don't actually think he's duplicitous about this. I just think it's sort of built into the thought. Sorry, there is some more stuff here that, that he talks about, which I kind of, you know, made me think. He talks about abstention as opposed to mm -hmm. not going into government, where he's talking about being MPs. You would have to constantly challenge the legitimacy of an, ex an elected parliament. Your victorious candidates would have to follow the example of Irish Republicans in refusing to attend and thus add legitimacy to the elected parliament. You might consider the Irish Republican policy of combining legal <laughs> with the legal struggle. But it is interesting, like, if you had a large movement and you won, like, you know, 20%, 50%, 40% of the vote and you didn't send any of them into parliament, you could, that could also delegitimize the bourgeois state in a way. That's what the Irish Republicans mm. are doing. Like, half mm. of the MPs in Northern Ireland, they don't sit. And they haven't done for 30 years, 40 years. So all mm. those seats... That would actually make maybe a left majority in Britain. They haven't done any they, like there would literally probably be a left majority in Britain now if you had the, the Irish Republicans in the parliament, like the Scottish Nationalists. I think that's an interesting idea for a related strategy. Yeah, and it, but, and it brings to mind, you know, what if if not for you know elections in this government, then what is a party for? <laughs> You know, like, which isn't necessarily a deflationary argument. The Irish Republican Party. Look, I mean, it might be for armed struggle, okay? Like, that's 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 what some of the Irish Republican stuff is about behind the scenes. That's, you know, part no, of what well, Not anymore. Not they, anymore. But they still don't sit. Yeah, they still yeah. don't sit. Even though, like, like, it would fix some problems right now if they did. I mean, there there are costs to that strategy. <laughs> no, 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 there, there are. And, and I guess the, the, what I'm bringing up is that there are historical reasons why Irish Republicanism could form political parties and not participate was because they had other political activities in mind. And most Leninism as a, as parties of activists, it's not just parties of activists in this abstract McNair sense. They were like, you know, combat organizations. Right. And that's what gate, that was the animating principle. And that's not your animating principle anymore. And you're able to maintain uh, an abstentionist sort of policy for a party, which, you know, I don't know, where else is there something like that? A big political formation that has, you know, a party structure that isn't doing armed struggle and isn't doing just, you know, party politics. And, and there are, there are, the only other example I can think of is temporal. It's not, it's not strategic like, uh, 
with the Irish, and that is like when the uh, the leftists and liberals in the Iranian parliament abstained. But that ended up being strategically kind of a big damn mistake. So well, but no, but but that's like tactical. Those are tactical abstentions. It's very rare that you get a strategy of not just abst- you know organizational independence, but abstention. Like this, it's kind of like a left, a pure left com strategy in a way of we're going to maintain party structure. You know, we're not like going to pop off the rev right now, chief. And we're like, actually going to participate in elections and just not, and then just not sit. Yeah. We're going to do like civil disobedience using your party structure because it's not or using your electoral structure because it's not fair because it's not really democratic. We want to demonstrate this in meaningful political action. Like you just don't really see this. That that is a that is a sui generis thing, as far as I can tell, and it's an example to learn from. But it's there for a historical reason, I guess. Yeah, well, the only parties that I can think of would do it are armed parties. Oh, like, yeah, ex armed parties. parties. Yeah, ex armed parties, and they started it when they were still armed. So, can we read uh, these bits here? I think Cockshot certainly goes more towards the social than McNair ever does in the book. In these paragraphs. Let's, let's have a read of some of this. You should be demanding a constitutional convention drawn by a lot from the population to redefine the state structure. You should be educating party members in the goals of revolutionary democracy so that if such bodies drawn by lot come into existence, then any party members who randomly find themselves allotted can come to play a leading role in the citizens' jury. The party members would have to be prepared to argue intransigently in a constitutional convention for the most radical and egalitarian structures. You would have to be prepared at time of major crisis or political scandal for the people themselves to take the initiative in forming such a convention drawn by lot. I think all that's good. It goes on, which is, I think, something that McNair doesn't say too much about. You have to argue in the trade unions movement that only by raising Labour's goals above the economic to the political could Labour be free. Yeah? Something McNair yeah. doesn't talk about. It goes further. That's, that's bringing the economic to the political. And here he goes to the social. Within the labor movement, you, you would have to be arguing for the abolition of the wages system in concrete, practical terms, explaining the relatively simple steps yeah, right, that a democratic assembly could take to achieve these goals. The struggle over wages and conditions is not enough to abolish the wage system. We must first win the battle of democracy. Uh, you know, I think, I think this emphasis on the economic that he puts here is very missing from McNair's. Agreed. I totally agreed. I mean Hallelujah. Amen. I yeah. mean like like I, I hated I hated the fact that I was so pissed off at this essay in the first half and the second half I was like singing Shaft Blass's places like <laughs> Hallelujah Shaft Blass like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> But I yeah it goes to a deep ambiguity in these sort of debates, I don't know, like it's been tremendously dissatisfying reading around recently because no one's ever really like very few people that I'm, I've been reading are, are like a hundred percent wrong or a hundred percent. Right. Basically. And even people that who's like politics that I'm so disturbed by, it's really disturbed by, I find Paul, I find shaft blast politics disturbing. You know, I, it really it makes me feel like that brains are modular. It's what it makes me feel like. I don't know. I don't know. People are functions of their conditions, aren't they? And everybody's conditions kind of messed up rubbish in them, can't they? I guess the genetics too. And you know, every and the genetics. But that should be pretty easy to solve with a simple neural network. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, <laughs> but uh, also there's like the epigenetics of your parents too. That's true. So I mean, yeah, it's like the function of your parents' conditions. And your parents heritability you know, and the more, genetics. Heritability is genetics. To talk about it is more useful to talk about it because not even just epigenetics, like general heritability, because a lot of social stuff is passed down. I think Lamb says that. Yeah. Did you read oh. that book, um, Derek? I, I right now I'm reading like five books at a time, very slowly. Is I'm, that one of them? Yeah, it is. Yeah, Jab- okay. Jablanca and Lamb, uh, Evolution of Four Dimensions. I'm reading oh. Evolution of Four Dimensions. I'm reading a bunch of histories of 1848. Like, I'm really digging down into that. When I was reading Jablanca and Lamb, I was like, I only read the genetics and the epigenetics part because I'm like, what? This is, like, not physical. But, like, <laughs> I don't know. I Like, I don't know what their argument is for, like, you know, I'm like, how, how can something, like... How can behaviors how do- be passed down? Yeah, I'm like, you, you need to give, like, a physical explanation of this. 
like what is the behavior like it's like it has to be accounted for physically like i, I didn't like like yeah uh, teaching I, is a physical act yo like visual uh, inputs <laughs> audio inputs. i know but it's like what well, like yeah, yeah, i'm like, not doing the engineers again no, 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 no. <laughs> behavior is the, the, the only all right we're, we're way off track but the only one yeah, of but, those the only one of those dimensions that isn't physical is the symbolic, which has it's, a place in physical. human intentional action. Like, yeah, it is physical. I know, I know it's Unlike physical, but it's not. Neurochemical like, level, whatever, but it doesn't. I don't think they, yeah. I don't, I don't think they systematized, like. I, I actually, I think that's probably fair that it's not systemic enough, but I wouldn't say it's not physical enough. Like, it's just not. Yeah. They're just they get they get loosey goosey in the second. Like I, I I I've just skimmed over the last two parts. I'm going to sit down with it sooner, but yeah. But uh, I mean, I think we have to deal with one of the things that I, I'm almost going to sound like a fucking plat, and I'm sorry. But one of the things that we have to deal with when we're dealing with that's it. A, yeah. wait, one last word. That's a really good book, though. Okay, it, it is. Yeah, that's like that's, that's like the best book on biology. Yeah. But because we live in contradictory times and in contradictory people, and we have contradictory material circumstances, and the loose sense of contradiction, not in the analytic sense of contradiction, before someone gets all analytic shamey on me. Looking at you, Lexi. Um, I'm not. I'm not. I know exactly what you mean. McNair uses contradiction in the same way. Right. I know, but I I know how it makes analytical Marxists cringe. Yeah, but it's it's from sociology. It's because uh, what's his face tried to do a non-Marxist theory of history and used it and got like a uh, some like I don't know limey prize for doing it. What's his name? You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. I think we need to like take the contradictions within the socialist movement a lot more seriously when we analyze it. And I, I'm going to end on praising both McNair and Cockshot, which you like a little bit for this in this exchange, is it really pushes on some tensions that go all the way back and they're never resolved. They aren't. I mean, like, I think we have to be honest that they're not resolved. And if they were resolved, we wouldn't be here. I don't think so. I think we'd still be here if they were resolved. <laughs> no, I genuinely... Because uh, I don't think that communism or socialism would have worked given the material conditions even of probably the 1920s. Well, yeah, I, I, I think I, it's more I, likely to work now. But I think that even if they had the right strategy in Marx's time and all that, it wouldn't have worked. Well, OK, I can, I, a, I can actually agree with you on that. But my, I think my thing is you couldn't even come up with the right strategy until some of these things are, are like materially dealt with. Like there's no way. I don't know that there's a way to totally preemptively know what you would need to do. I, I don't think this is solely a thinking problem. And this is the, you know, this, this is my like now 10 year debate with Douglas Lane is actually in this statement. You cannot preemptively think your way out of a social system. <laughs> Otherwise you get, a, you get into like Adorno, like despair, I think, because you'll always think yourself in the, into, into impasses because you can't see the material conditions changing. Cause there's some stochastic elements. Like you say, Derek, and I totally agree. The capitalist didn't invent capitalism fucking thing just kind of evolved and happened and smashed and barged its way through. And that's a similar thing. But like, it's not to say that they, they didn't strategize, but it's, you know, you need to strategize, but you're not going to get everything right. This prefigurative no notion of Owen and these, it's the same problem we have today, isn't it? Yeah, we, we need to be practical about this. You know, like uh, there's a lot of political strategists that know you can't do all that. And they, you know, I don't know. It's not so novel outside the Marxist tradition. Just we're used to being able to, we're used to feeling like, because we have a sort of earlier lens of social science, maybe, that we could predict more than we can. And so when we figure out that, you know, the owl of Minerva flies at midnight or whatever, then we kind of give up on orienting, using knowledge at all. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. I hope eventually out of these like extended debates, there will eventually be some kind of, I don't know, pragmatic cash value for people that look at me and go, okay, if you don't want me to be in like a theory in like a Lenin worship cult and then, you know, do trade union activism, what should I do? I mean, I, I can't convince some of these people that trade union activism is different than being in a Lenin cult. You know what I mean? I can definitely see how it pays me more. Yeah. Oh, I think it is different. I, they, But they, it's not enough for them to do trade union stuff for some reason. They want like some political... They want they want a political kind of orientation that they can take as you know agents. Yeah, I, I don't know what to tell them. <laughs> I don't know what to tell people like that. Other than you know, don't get into a cult. Just join a religion. It'll hurt your trade union activism less. I guess where I come out of this is that uh, 
you know, given the sort of political mood that we're in right now, it's a lot of discontent. There's a lot of resentment of politics. I, I wonder if the argument for the Democratic Republic is better served by some of the, the proposals that Cockshot's making at the end here. Because I think that these kind of latch on to like actual concerns that people have today. Whereas McNair's arguments feel, at least to me, they, they feel like a lot of kind of like fiddling with the uh, details of government as I, as I know it, more than uh, really uh, making substantial changes that address people's like uh, distrust and hatred of the political class and uh, of, the, of the bosses and of uh, the capitalist system. So I kind of wonder if like, you know, taking up some of these proposals, we might have something that would be a little bit more usable in these circumstances today than what we got at the end of McNair. Um, I think the, the, the main issue for me would be saying, okay, like Cockshot has these kind of like strategies and proposals. Those are great. Could we maybe link those up with some of the strategic concerns that McNair brings up about like continental blocks and that sort of thing? I guess I find this like, oh yeah, I could go talk to people about this and they'd think it would be pretty weird, but um, I don't think it's, I don't, I don't think like, you know, so you, you look at something like XR and like they have like a sortition orientation, right? That seems to be like the part of their program that's receiving the least attention, but there have been examples of sortition being used like in the last 20 years to decide sort of issues of public importance. And I mean, I think it could enter the political discussion. You're talking about Extinction Rebellion it uses, it has a sortition part of its proposal. I've never mm -hmm. heard of that. Yeah. Yeah. It wants to do a, uh, I, don't, I don't know if they still have this position, but when they started out, they wanted to create a sortition based uh, body in order to make recommendations to parliament about what needed to be done and then just like use the, the weight of moral authority to push parliament to do them. So, you know, I, I feel like this stuff could kind of be in the conversation and, and might actually have some purchase with people given the sort of like anti-political sentiments that we have today. I just don't know if the, the way that XR is presenting it is really going to be the most constructive. So, so this is our official wrap up. Final thoughts on the whole McNair series, because this is the last of this series. We're going to be starting soon enough one on the 18th Brumaire. How do people feel about the whole experience of going through this? It was a long four episodes. <laughs> no, a long march through revolutionary strategy. <laughs> I started off, you know, trying to figure out, you know, kind of why the McNairis thing got so weird, you know, but I didn't know how weird things were going to get basically. And uh, I don't know. This was pretty eye opening. Like, I'd like to think I've learned something, but I think I just need to like chew on it a bunch basically. Ultimately. Yeah. It, I feel like I've raised more questions than I have answered, <laughs> even though there's a useful analytic at work here. I, I, I feel like I need to go back through history a lot more than I was going to before and look at the, the genealogies of these things, but also look at all these, these things that we're missing and these sub movements that didn't happen. Not because I think they're going to contain the answers, but sometimes they, they, they bring up more interesting questions. You think of Martov, you think of, you think of a lot of American movements that we've just forgotten about. Like we just pretend that there was no left in America before like the SP US, I mean the SPA and stuff like that. And that's just not true. So I, I, I think this was really eye opening to me to go back through for my third time. But even though I think I became much more hostile to it through the process of engaging with it than I even expected, I, I knew I was going to be skeptical, but like towards the end, I was like, fucking McNair. But I, I, I really appreciate the book. I think a lot of people, you know, that might as, seen my engagement with this book might have, I guess, thought of me as a straightforward McNairist. And I think I, you know, would sometimes read him in an autonomous way that maybe he doesn't even mean. I basically think that he's like a really interesting foil for whatever's coming next. <laughs> like, we're probably better off for having like engaged with this stuff. Like, I think we are. But as for like how much I can advocate this, it just, it's highly qualified because of what it's missing. What Cockshot says about it in the beginning is apt. It's a, it's a big step forward from let's just join up with the Democrats.
or let's not do anything at all. But as far as like taking the conversation much further than that, you have to get more complicated than this. Uh, Puya. Yeah, I, th I think it's okay. I thought the book was all right. I think he has good politics, but sometimes I wish like, you know, some of the stuff he says is like, you want a little more. There you go. That's Puya. The, the word probably a few more times. Yeah, um, I mean, probably a... need a, a material. <laughs> <laughs> and uh what other words would i like to see more um, um concrete concrete material um, conditions economic uh, development labor, <laughs> labor uh, prices, social that's a good uh, one equalization <laughs> equalization fall rate of profit um well i must say i really enjoyed the, i really enjoyed doing it i think we learned a goddamn lot reading this i think there's definitely large portions of his strategy we all agree with and take away we probably feel that it's not enough but hopefully with the different reading group series together we'll start forming some kind of a something or other what do people think is there a synthesis so i i guess like my my general thoughts about revolutionary strategy are so i i came to this book feeling a lot of disillusionment with social democratic politics in canada and especially in Alberta, and the situation in Alberta just seems to get worse and worse. And I guess, like, where I stand on this point, or on this book, is that, like, again, yeah, it's that kind of cart before the horse problem, right? Like, I feel like I don't really understand the material and political situation in this province well enough to actually even begin to say what parts of this would be valid here. What parts of this could like I start to advocate in a useful way, as opposed to just saying like, here's the minimum program. This is like proven out by socialist history. Let's just stick with that. Like, I, I feel like that's, that's just too doctrinaire. And I, I guess what it leaves me with is a desire to better understand my circumstances so that I can evaluate how I actually feel about its practicability. Yeah, it, 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 I think this has been said multiple times, but it feels like it's kind of often an abstract zone of historical extrapolation and thought that um, often feels like it could be uh, suggesting a new point of view on your circumstances. But it's really hard to say because it, it, it is, again, quite alien from, say, just your common discourse about social democratic politics today. There's a lot of reconcile re reconciliation work that needs to be done there. Well, I must say that like the series has got a lot of positive feedback from listeners and patrons and stuff like that. So I think it's definitely been worthwhile. I thought that we'd bring in, we're going to be going on to doing the Brumaire soon. And somebody, somebody just sent me a tweet about how Karl Marx's death was reported in one of the Irish newspapers in, what year was it? 1886? Anybody? Off the top, know. not sure. Was... Uh, 83. 83. Here we go. Do you want to read? This is funny. The Avenir Liberal announces the death of Karl Marx, the chief of the International Society. The next sentence then, <laughs> that's all it says. It goes... Notice, report of Dr. Arthur Hill Hassel, analyst of the Laurel <laughs> Sanitary Commission, author of Food and Its Adulterations, etc., on Myers Semolina. And then there's a long thing about <laughs> Semolina. Oh, <sure. laughs> <laughs> they contain a very large percentage of nitrogenous matter, chiefly wow. gluten, and are far more nutritious than any <clears throat> other food, such as arrowroot, tapioca, sago, <laughs> corn flour. <laughs> Farinicaceous <laughs> food, ordinary wheat flour, or any of the cereals oh in God. use as food in this country. Signed, Arthur Hill Hassel, MD, London. Highly recommended by the faculty for infants, invalids, oh. and etc. It makes delicious puddings, custards, blanc mange, etc. After a trial, no family will be without. Myers Semolina. <laughs> there you go, everybody. Karl oh. Marx and Myers Semolina. Is that uh, physical enough <laughs> in terms of Marxist analysis? <laughs> Marx, the person Karl Marx is only a social abstraction, really. Who had the most influence? 
Let's see if we can find Myers Semolina. Let's see if it still exists. <laughs> oh man, that is good. Echoing Who's throughout Myers the ages. Semolina? I don't know. Pro- probably not the author of the most important, like secular, you know, writing of all time. The most inf- the most influential secular writing of all time. Here, here's a yeah. here's a clip from the the Freemason Journal of June third, eighteen seventy one. Here we go, Myers Semolina. Anybody see that? Oh my there god! There you go. I, I do see it. That's they got around, you know. Look, look at all it those won prize 24, medals. It won twenty four prize medals. Let's read a little <laughs> bit more. The manufacture of Myers Semolina <laughs> was established in eighteen fifteen. It's the <laughs> oldest and the largest in the world. Twenty five million pounds been yearly produced. Shit, man, that's a lot. Our semolina is a staple fruit in France, Russia, Spain, Italy, etc., and will soon be that of England. No, <laughs> Karl Marx, the famous internationalist, oh has just God. died. Going forward. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> what you're saying is that we didn't read the Aristotle, but we or or the conditions for extreme democracy that Cockshot put out there, but we did read three paragraphs on Meyer Semolina. <laughs> you know, it was really fast, actually. Like once you just start talking about semolina, then the, the reading just, series just goes. Um, it just goes down smooth. I thought you were going to say something it? about the 18th Brevere, though, Tom. No, I just like. Uh, <laughs> I think we should have a Meyer semolina reading group series. I think that's that's it's the okay. future. I don't think I need to spend my weekends doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, I mean, I like, be eating Meyer semolina instead of just talking about it. Praxis, baby. Well, do, oh, do, do we do we want to at least like ah oh, man, this is way too late. But McNair had you know what he said about was what he listed as extreme democracy, and then Cockshot gave his version. Those would mm-hmm. be those would have been fine things to read. Uh, so Cockshot says, "What does McNair give us as the political measures necessary to achieve this extreme democracy?" And then he quotes Mc. I guess he's paraphrasing McNair, maybe quoting universal military training and service, democratic, political and trade union rights within the military and the right to keep and bear arms election and recallability of all public officials, public officials to be on an average skilled workers wage abolition of official secrecy laws and of private rights of copyright and confidentiality self-government in the localities, i.e. removal of powers of central government control and patronage and abolition of judicial review of decisions of elected bodies, and abolition of constitutional guarantees of the rights of private property and freedom of trade. And then Cockshot says, this is striking about what this emits. How are political decisions to be reached in this extreme democracy? He goes into his note about the Federalists and Aristotle, and we could have read that, but we didn't. But let's just go down to, if McNair really wanted to follow the logic of the working class party being the most consistent advocate of democracy, what he should be demanding is the replacement of all parliaments, councils, assemblies, and quangos by jury drawn randomly from the population, the right of initiative and referendum with taxes and the budget to be submitted to popular vote. She has a footnote about how this can be accomplished easily and securely using telephones. Declarations of war only by popular vote is a sub point. Next point, full political rights, including the right to elect officers in the armed forces and abolition of the judiciary and magistracy. Juries to be supreme in courts, no loss of liberty without jury trial. I don't, yeah. I don't disagree with any of them. No, no, no. I think together they make like a pretty good like compound, like structural set of suggestions, you might say. Like it's not quite a program, but it's a... Uh, it's like the raw materials for one, maybe. If you could work any of that out in advance in any meaningful way, which I'm convinced that social science or, you know, that some kind of political science answer to that is possible. It's just probably going to be more distorted by, you know, the romance of the previous kind of movements. Then it usually like learns the lessons of those movements, usually gets kind of seduced by the romance. This is some kind of attempt to draw out the main, like the main points, really things that aren't just like kind of woundedly protecting some kind of outdated tradition. These things are interesting and important. It, it's interesting here. He says uh, public officials to be on an average skilled workers wage. Sinn Féin, the Irish Republicans, they actually, all of their MPs only take the average industrial wage as their 
wage and all the money goes into like the party. How many left parties in the world do something like that? Wouldn't imagine many. <laughs> not, not many. Seriously. Not many. Jeremy Corbyn doesn't. Yeah, it's not like vanishingly small, but I would say it is a very. It's definitely a small minority. Yeah. This is, you know, a, maybe like the most practical distillation. Those two kind of groups, those groups of demands, maybe together. That's a practical distillation of not just McNair, but then like, you know, these kind of critiques of McNair that are put in here by Cockshot. I, I just figured it was worth a roundup of those basic points as a sort of summary. Because like, you know, a lot of us have broader problems with Cockshot's political framing or McNair's kind of political fetish or focus. Mm -hmm. But on paper, we don't have a problem with these principles for the most part. Maybe we could quibble. As general principles of like, mm -hmm. hey, what do we want in our polity? I would, I would agree with them. The details of constitutionalism, I think, would be a major point to build out because it's inadequate what's uh, discussed mm -hmm. there. But uh, I think the, you know, like there are a lot of points here that are quite unpopular, but are worth mm. debating and arguing for, right? You know, universal military service with election of officers, like, well, that's <laughs> pretty far outside of the realm of what's accepted. <laughs> you know, abolition of copyright, pretty big. Abolition of like judicial review of uh, elected parliament decisions, uh, or not elected parliament, but parliamentary decisions. That's that's yeah. an enormous one because you know the amount of legitimacy that Supreme Courts have is very very strong, even among the so-called yeah. U.S. left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, especially when you have like progressive decisions that are so, you know, there's so much gridlock around keeping things the way they are that the Supreme Court has to weigh in to make gay marriage legal or something. Yeah, I mean, there's this point that beer stuff needs to be considered more when discussing polity. Like, I think it's definitely relevant to the form of constitutionalism, right? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. what is the structure of these bodies? I think that beer stuff's really important there because, yeah, that, that, that could be very valuable. I, I know, like, in Canada, like, you, you'd have a really hard time arguing against the Supreme Court on the left because a lot of the treaty process is going through the courts. Mm. It's not that the people are going to the courts because they love the courts, but it's that it allows an avenue of political struggle that has no representation in elected bodies at all. And, and you know, these things were kind of set up as, you know, bourgeois treaties and mostly the nations are like, hey, you want to like fall through on these fucking contracts we signed? You goddamn hypocrites. Yeah. Or, or even if there was no treaty signed and they're trying to figure out what one, what one might be, you know. Right. And so, you know, stopping pipelines with court uh, right. action, right. like that kind of stuff is real standard on the left. So, and like generally speaking, I guess, you know, there's, there's not a lot of legitimacy in elected legislative bodies. So you kind of have to do like a two-pronged approach to this of arguing against legislatures but also arguing against undemocratic judicial rule over the polity, because like that's really uh, kind of neoliberal uh, mm. point, right? But the point is, you know, we we're, this is crucial feedback, Mike. You know, I want to see like a a more robust and you know kind of like systematic version of this theory, because I think it's one of it was one of like the better things that I read, like that was trying to defend the, even the very basics or recover anything of the basics of the Marxist, you know, political tradition or whatever. I, this is a perspective that I'd like to see stronger, you know, like I want, I want to, I want there to be an option for alienated subjectivity and people that would be radicals or people that would fucking join cults or something. I want there to be a positive option for them. So nihilism doesn't force them in to, to feel like that they have to join a cult. Cause that's, that's what I see a lot of. I want there to be yeah. like a positive political option for people. That, that isn't yeah, just there, like that. There's the final picture of Mike giving us a nice old glimpse, a wry smile. Maybe we are the cult. Seriously, myself and my mate were going to set up a cult called the Fish People of Atlantis, but it never got off the ground. Now, everybody, <laughs> that's a true story. Let's go. We'll see you all in the future. So long. Bye-bye. Right. Au revoir. Au revoir.
On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and The Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening. Please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jump to Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. <laughs>